much for joining us today on Feeling Good. Sponsored by Warren County Community Services. I'm your host, Shelley Abrams, and I am delighted to introduce to you today our guest. Paul is one of our two camera people here at the studio, and we are actually joining you live from the studio today. The first time in, I think, probably a year that we have been live in the studio. So we are delighted to be here. I'm delighted that Paul's here, and I can't wait until you hear um, everything that Paul has to share with us today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And Paul, thanks for joining us today. How's it feel to be on the other side of the camera? It, it is different. It's it, different to be on the other side. I, <laughs> as I said before, I miss the earphones to know what's going on. <laughs> well, we could put earphones on you, but that might be a little distracting, right? So anyway, um, okay, now the audience is wondering just what Paul is up to. And um, I'd like to open our discussion today by asking you about one of your favorite hobbies, your interest in photography. When did that begin? Well, my interest in photography started in the 1940s. You can tell from that that I'm old. <laughs> and uh, my father had a uh, Kodak camera, I think from the 30s. It was, a, it was a compact, but it was a little bellows camera. You opened it up and f it folded out. And he gave that to me to play with, and I shot uh, photos for quite a while, of neighbor kids and buildings and things like that. And I saved up some money to buy a 35-millimeter uh, camera. Uh, the advantage of a 35-millimeter camera is that I could process the film at home, and I bought an enlarger out of my allowance and built a dark room in our old coal cellar. If, if you're, uh, you can ask your parents about what coal cellars are. Uh, and we, we cleaned it out in the, I think the, uh, the middle, maybe late 50s. That was my dark room okay. and, and it was perfect. Okay, good. Um, High school experiences? Yes. In, um, 1959, um, I graduated from high school, and my parents rewarded me. I guess they didn't think I was going to graduate, but they rewarded me and uh, took me on a train ride starting in Chicago, uh, the Grand Canyon, which I didn't know they were going to stop at, and Los Angeles, Disneyland, and San, San Francisco. Uh, it was quite a ride. And what I have on the screen now are some photos from that 1959 travel. Um, let me just start off. We're going to explain more about uh, what these albums are and about what, what Flickr is. But I put together some photos that are the, are the best that I think from, from this entire collection. Okay. And... Um, So if we go on there, this is a train station. I think we took a train from Columbus, Ohio to Chicago, and this was, it says here Chicago, but I'm pretty sure it was Columbus at night. This was Chicago downtown. Looks like it was from a skyscraper of some sort. I like the idea of the lake and the elevated roads. Uh, I had never seen buildings like this before, and it was quite, quite a sight to see uh, multi-lane roads going through the center of the city. This is uh, the Merchandise Mart, mm -hmm. a famous building. I think at one time it was the largest building in, in the country. Um, this is just a typical street in Chicago, but I like the idea of the signs and the and the cars and the traffic, you can see the very old cars. So you were already aware of composition, for instance, when it comes to taking uh, great photos? 
even well, at that time? Well, I that that's a very good question. I um, I, I studied, okay. and uh, the important person in the 40s and 50s on photocomposition was Ansel Adams. And uh, he started really uh, in the 1910, 1920. I think he had some sort of contract with the government to mm -hmm. photograph some of the canyons in the mm -hmm. West. But his books on composition and film and exposure, exposure was very important on film. Uh, most film doesn't have the latitude the di a digital does today. But the composition was very, very important. And that's okay. what I tried to do. I could only do so much at home. But when I saw things like this on the train, this was a dome train. And even though we didn't have a, a seat up there, I went up there and shot some photos. This was shot from another dome. These were shots from domes. I like the, the rivers, the canyons. So I was looking backwards. Uh, the black and white film was less expensive, mm -hmm. and I think I only had three rolls of color film that I bought. This was the Grand Canyon. Uh, I, this, was, uh, this was quite an experience, because when you stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, if you've never been there, there's no feeling of depth, mm -hmm. because this area is so far away that there's, there's no feeling of depth. The only thing you can judge it on is the, um, is the foreground here. But, but the colors, contrasts, I tried to frame it the best I could. Uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, let's see, the Colorado River is showing, I think, there. I encourage anybody that is in that area uh, to spend maybe a day there. I went back in 1985 and actually camped at the the rim of the canyon. Oh. I don't know if we can do that any, or they can do that anymore. This is Los Angeles. This is a famous train station. It is still there today. I saw something on TV the other day about it. Uh, if you remember uh, the famous uh, Moulin Rouge, mm -hmm. this was a famous nightclub in Los Angeles. I think I shot this from a tour bus. Spike Jones was uh, a, a musician, uh, and I think he used a wide arrangement of instruments from what I can remember. This is some color of Disneyland, some black and white in Disneyland. There's the Matterhorn. So that would have been the early years of Disneyland? I this was the, I think, yes. I think it uh, maybe was 55 or 56 when it opened. Okay. Very, very early. There are more photos. In, in the collection, this is just a, 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 a small assortment. Uh, then we went from there to San Francisco. This is the Golden Gate Bridge that everybody knows about, but I shot this from the opposite side of San Francisco. I kind of like that framing right. uh, of the cars going around the bend into that. And of course, the, uh, the cable cars. Mm -hmm. And I think this was Chinatown. And this was Muir Woods with the very giant trees. Oh, very good. I, um, I think I inherited uh, the photo genes from my dad. I think we've, we've talked about this before. Uh, my dad took home movie film. And he took home movies of me and my brother Christmas, birthdays, Christmas, birthdays, every year from 1951 until we graduated from college. And now we've got them spliced together, which we'll talk about on a, on a VCR tape. And I think that's how we got to talking yes. about photography, because I was asking you, how do I put, you know, 50, 60 years worth, 70 almost years worth of of photo moments, um, you know, together in an organized manner, and then you have you have helped me ever since. So, so speaking of uh, college days that you know we've chatted about as well, where did you go to college? I studied electrical engineering at Ohio University in Athens, and. Um, 
OU, if you've never been to OU in Athens, it is a throwback. I think it's over 200 years old. It goes back to, I think, uh, eight, the 1800s. It was one of the very early public schools. And I really enjoyed the photography there of the old buildings. Uh, the, um, let, let's look at some of the buildings. Th this is a, a, a collection. What you're viewing on here is a collection, called a collection, of albums. And uh, the other thing you can see on here is, is a lot of words on the side. So this is optional. You can do whatever you want to. And OU had a, a desk computer where the computer was the entire desk. And it was one of the first ones on the market called an LGP-30. I kind of fell in love with that in my junior year and senior year. So there's more information about that. But let, let's look at some of the the unusual ph photographs of OU. OU and the Hawking River. Mm -hmm. The Hawking River went right through the campus and virtually every year it flooded. These are some photos of the dorms with water. Uh, I walked through many a flood water to get to classes. This is a reflection of that in the, uh, in the water. Um, gas stations flooded out. This is a photograph here from the engineering school, which was high. I guess the engineers figured out that you want to be on high ground. <laughs> and this was a bridge, but I think there's another photograph. It'll show that the bridge ends in the water. Um, you can see the water on the bridge. And that's, that's kind of an interesting with a fire plug in the water. So uh, when, you're, when you're at OU and you're taking pictures, do you, um, do you take your film and at that point in time, did you take your film somewhere to have it? Very, very good question. I processed the film myself. Processing. I could process okay. it in my room. I lived in private housing, not in a dorm. So I could, I could do that in private housing. And the journalism school allowed me access to their dark room. Okay. So I could bring my film in and make prints. I supplied my own paper. Um, so was re photography really a thing that, I mean, was it, was it a popular hobby at that time, would you say? Or was it more of a, a specific kind of unique um, skill for you to be? Well, I'm not sure, it's a long time ago, but I'm not sure a lot of people shot 35 millimeter film. Okay. Uh, most of it was a box camera, if you remember mm -hmm. that name, mm -hmm. as opposed to, the advantage of 35 millimeter film is that it is small, the cameras are small, very portable, and it's fairly easy to process the film in, in a tank. You just roll up the film in a tank in a dark room and Poor, poor chemicals in it. But, um, Which sounds easy to you, but it sounds like it takes time and skill to be able to do that, especially if you're doing it on your own. Well, it, it, uh, I'm not sure my roommates uh, liked <laughs> it, but uh, uh, they didn't give, give me too much grief. Uh, what was your first job after OU? Did it have anything to do with photography by any chance? Uh, no, it was not uh, anything to do with photography. Um, in 1963, I joined a company in Columbus, Ohio called Industrial Nucleonics. They were a pioneer for using radioactive materials uh, that were uh, researched during World War II. And the idea was to measure uh, process materials like uh, paper, plastic, steel, measure the thickness of those materials by beaming the radiation through the material without contacting the material in any way. Okay. So I, um, an, an interesting thing about uh, industrial nu nucleonics is all of their new engineers went into field service because they wanted uh, new engineers to have an appreciation for how the products were used by customers very harsh environments. Paper mills are very hot 
and wet and, and not pleasant to be in for a long period of time. So I eventually liked paper mills and enjoyed being in them, but uh, it was quite a shock. Okay, interesting. Well, when did you move to this area then? What brought you here? Well, in uh, 1965, I took an engineering position at the Omar Corporation in Cincinnati. And in uh, 1978, my wife and I found Lebanon. <laughs> and uh, in 1988, I was asked to create Omart's International Division. Okay. And this position involved traveling for business throughout Europe and Asia. And I traveled always with a film camera. I'll be showing uh, through this uh, show more of those photos, but it really offered a different view. I never expected to take international photos, uh, expected mostly to be in the United States. Okay, all right, interesting. So what started your interest then in, I can only imagine, in converting your video slides and negatives to digital? How many, how many photos and videos would you guess that you had at that point? Well, from those uh, four decades of, um, of film, primarily, I, uh, in the 90s, I shot some, uh, some videos on videotape, but I would say it was several thousand. It could have been uh, maybe five to, to seven thousand okay. photos. Okay. And I first started, thought that I could put them online by making a website. I made, made a website, tried to put photos on the website, which I could, but I was faced with the problem of trying to organize the, the photos because uh, they were so varied with four World's Fairs and, and uh, th close to thir 30 countries in, in Europe and Asia. It was very difficult to organize those. And, uh, but I was able to uh, scan the slides and negatives and photos. Uh, what I did is I used an Epson V600. It's a device, it's very low cost, it interfaces with your computer, and you put in slides and negatives, and it will scan the slides. Uh, in order to scan transparent materials, you have to shine the light through the, the material. It isn't like scanning a photo, which you can do on an office printer or an office scanner. Um, and I probably scanned over 10,000 uh, photos and slides there. Uh, some of them I have not put online, so some of them I have used. I wanted to mention also the uh, Lebanon Library has a v V600, or they had one before the pandemic. And uh, I suggest if you're in the area and you have slides and negatives, call the library and see if that uh, scanner is available. Okay. And is that in their tech center? It is in the te tech center. Okay. Uh, call the library, 513-932-BOOK, uh, and ask for the te tech center. They'll be very helpful. But when I talked to them the other day, uh, they still weren't sure of what parts of the building are going to be open and what services they will have. Okay. All right. But just tell them Paul sent me and they'll Absolutely. They'll know. They'll, they'll Roll out the red carpet, if okay. you say, Paul. Very good. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, um, could you tell us how you did organize? I know you showed us uh, a little bit as you were going to, you know, some of your specific uh, trips, but how do you place your photos online? What would you recommend? Well, I use Flickr. Um, the screen you're seeing is my home page. And I refer okay. to terms like homepage, which is similar to a website. You have a, a homepage is generally a, um, a page that you can go to other pages. It has links to other pages or it, it says the page number. With, with Flickr, you can organize things so that this page links down to 8,000 photos and videos. 
and it is linked by location. Now you can link it. Everything is free form. This could be a wedding. Uh, this could be a, um, a trip on a train. This could be anything. I created this myself and I must say that when I first started, all I did was upload and made albums that you saw before. Okay. I weren't sure how I was going to organize them, but as it became obvious, North and South America was a typical organization point. Uh, Europe, uh, we can just click on that for, for Europe and you can see the European uh, countries. Um, these are also collections because you can see that it says albums. So there are albums of photos. There could be a hundred uh, photos beneath e each one. But this is a very nice way of organizing and to make it easy not only for yourself, but for people that are viewing the photos. Right. Uh, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough the, the value of doing this. It's the organizational process, and I think we've talked in the past, Shelley, about organizing. It's one thing to scan them, it's the one thing to digitize them, or if you have uh, digital photos, I started shooting digital in 2000, uh, they all go, go together. I have several hard drives full of, of photos and videos. But how do you organize? How do you explain all of those to your friends, maybe even the public? Right. Which we'll get into later about you teaching. I sat in a class where you were teaching us how to do this organizing using Flickr. So I'll, we'll, we'll share that um, a little bit later. So what are some of your, um, you know, some of your other areas? I, I know that you've, uh, you've traveled throughout Ohio. You've traveled throughout the region of the U.S. You've traveled worldwide. Uh, tell, us, tell us about some additional uh, key places uh, that, you know, in, in maybe North and South America displays or uh, in the United States where you've traveled. Well, there, there are several places in the United States and s several places around the world that I favor. Uh, the one that's closest to, to here is the Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. Mm -hmm. This is a very unique, it's called a museum, it uses that word, but we're talking about uh, 100 acres of land, which is more than, than the Smithsonian in Washington has. Oh. And uh, you have to go back to, to Henry, Henry Ford, he was uh, obviously known for automobiles, but he was also a collector. He collected things. He collected um, uh, trains and uh, steam engines and uh, people. One of his big collections of people was Thomas Edison. Ah, as he, a friend. He, 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 he loved Thomas Edison. Uh -huh. They were about the same age. And the, the story goes that in, uh, uh, I think in 1925, when the Ford Museum opened, uh, that was the opening. But, and the opening was set uh, 1925 or 26, and he had a big party. He invited all the dignitaries from all over the country, including the president. Oh, really? Why 1926? 1926 was the 50th anniversary of the invention of the light bulb. Uh -huh. So that's quite a party, but he built the Ford Museum in Greenfield Village as much as a, uh, as a monument for Thomas Edison as for himself. Well, I, would, I have visited um, when I was 10. <laughs> so it's been a few years. I remember it was a family vacation to the uh, Deerfield um, and the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village. And you know, around here, what reminds me of that area is Carillon Park in Dayton. Uh, kind of a similar sort of feel to immersing yourself in history and being surrounded by historic buildings and so on. So it's not just a, you know, one building museum with exhibits. You're actually walking like you say, you're walking throughout history. Wouldn't yes. you agree? 
Oh, oh, exactly, e exactly. You, you can see there's many albums. Uh, let me explain a little bit more. The Ford Museum okay. is, is a separate building. It's uh, similar size to a large aircraft hangar. And there is uh, several planes in it. Um, let, me just, let me just show some, some of my best photos. I call them the best. I, um, I, I like, like them all. We could show some photos of that. These are some of the cars, uh, stationary steam engines, uh, the um, start of the Industrial Revolution okay. started with steam engines. Before, let's say, the middle 1800s, uh, power was created by animals. If you wanted to ma make a pump and pump water out of a coal mine, you had animals going around in a circle. These are stationary steam engines, and of course Henry Ford had to have the very first one, and the very first one I think is from uh, uh, 1740. This is a, a, a generator in, in the museum that uh, Edison built for one of Ford's factories. I was going to say there was some collaboration among these inventors, wasn't there? Yes, yes. The, the, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, th this was an interesting, I don't know what it calls, I call it a marshmallow um, uh, settee or, or something oh, or okay. sofa. Okay. Uh, that was in the museum. Ah. Let me roll down to some other ones. Here are some of the large trains that he has in the museum. These are inside the building. Massive. And now we go outside to Greenfield Village, and there is a steam engine. There are several steam engines that are there, and they en go entirely around the park. And Edison at work. This was some of his work with the phonograph and, of course, the light bulb. Right. Very uh, good. Well, I can see that when you go on trips um, and everything, I know it happens to me. I think, oh, here's a, here's a photo op, here's a photo op, here, you know, and, and uh, it seems that, that your attention is drawn to different objects, different, um, you know, displays, etc. And you, and you try to, you try to get a little different perspective on it than just a usual camera shot, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yes, uh, the, uh, the camera shot here is uh, of Edison's laboratory. I mean, Edison didn't just invent the, uh, the electric bulb, the incandescent bulb by himself. He had a very large laboratory, and these are some of the chemicals he used because the important thing was the filament. Mm -hmm. the, the, the filaments would last maybe a few hours and then burn out, and he tried everything. He was not a scientist, he was not an engineer, but he didn't give up. He would just try everything. He knew he could make an electric light bulb. And the advantage of the electric light bulb, of course, it replaced gas lights, which were dangerous. Mm -hmm. Cities were um, basically uh, had pipes of gas in, in all the buildings. I remember my grandfather's house he wasn't using them, but it had pipes on the wall for a gas light. Well, you, you and I have talked about when the museum might be open again uh, after the quarantine and, and so on. So it may be gradually uh, opening, but in lieu of people actually traveling there right now, I know on Saturday mornings I watch Mo Rocca on Innovation Nation, yes, yes. which is sponsored by the Henry Ford museum and located there. So you get a little feel for what a trip, uh, trip to Greenfield Village would, might be. No, no, you're exactly right. And that, uh, as, as a matter of fact, um, I had planned to give a uh, ILR, as the Inst Institute of Learning and Retirement lecture at Miami uh, on the Ford Museum I think a couple weeks before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the schools were, were closed. 
Uh, I hope to do that maybe either end of this year or next year uh, because it, it is, it's not just the past, it is also the, the future and the methods that these people, for example, one of the things that I was intrigued about was um, the Wright brothers' family home is there. Mm -hmm. The bicycle shop, now I think he's had several, they had several bicycle shops, but in the back of the bicycle shop was a prototype of their first engine for the airplane. Oh, okay. They were boring out the cylinders or mm -hmm. showing this model of the boring. And that was very interesting mm -hmm. as well to, mm -hmm. to see that. So uh, if, if you plan to go Ford Museum in Greenfield Village, I would plan on at least two days. Okay. To, right. to see it all, because we haven't talked about Greenfield Village, and we, we don't really have time today to talk about it. Uh, That's another show. That is another show. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to provide an email at the end of this uh, presentation, and feel free to email me about photography and where I've been and okay. how, how to scan uh, slides and, and negatives. Okay, very good. Well, I know in, in talking about our travels and so forth, I'm actually getting ready um, to take a quick little trip to Hilton Head, which brings up our next um, topic location of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, that seems to be a favorite of yours. Um, you know, share with us a little bit about Charleston. Well, Charleston is unique. If, if you remember the, 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 the history uh, the founding of the country by the British, they came into Charleston. Charleston means Charles Town, mm -hmm. named after, I guess, King, King Charles. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are buildings there over 300 years old and people are living in them. Beautiful churches, uh, all sorts of, of uh, really can't take a bad, bad picture, just, just like the Grand Canyon really can't take a bad picture. Let, let me see if I have a, uh, a kind of an assortment okay. of, of photos of... Oh, there you go, Charleston Best. Yeah, that's, that's my album. I put them together j just for this, and this is, this is what's called the battery. This is, uh, you might say, well, it's on the water. It, it really isn't on the ocean. It's on the battery. It's on a, it's on a river that comes up uh, the... Uh, and this was an interesting shot showing the homes, the beautiful homes, multi-century homes mm -hmm. on this. Uh, this. This is a building, and I thought this looked like to me uh, some place in London mm -hmm. where you see an old bicycle, you, you see these uh, brick homes and the, and the windows. This was an, another shot. The, uh, the first shot we had was, was on the right side but you can see the, the mansions there. These are some of the beautiful churches. Um, and we, we, had, uh, lot, we, we went there many, many times in the, in the 90s for the music, and most of the music was, uh, was in, in the churches. Mm -hmm. This is a stained glass window. Um, uh, we traveled to the beach once. <laughs> My time, okay. And, and this was the uh, this was the ocean, and I wanted to frame it in some way. Was it was difficult say, to I frame. Like, I like that framing. Uh, without the uh, without the wood. Right. They they had just built this uh, very interesting uh, suspension bridge, and I like the symmetry of the bridge. Mm -hmm. I shot this from the top of a uh, parking garage, so I could get uh, directly to it. This is Middleton Place. This is a, uh, I guess you would call it a plantation. This is about uh, eight miles north of Charleston. Beautiful waters that flow in and out. These, these I guess you would call them a, a lagoons. Um, you just can't take a bad picture there. Right, I right. think uh, some of these have been used as backdrops for weddings. Well, let me ask you about that though. When you were using um, your original camera and, and so forth and you're filming and so on, um, you couldn't really see the, the photo like we do now. That's right. And, and then you would like, well, I hope I got the shot all right. That, that's, that's I hope right. I got what I was, you know, aiming toward. 
uh, quite a difference in today's digital world. Well, and that is right. Uh, when I shot film, uh, I'll show you some things of uh, things in the sky, some laser things in the sky. Uh, that, those were shot on film and I had to take multiple uh, shots right, and they, they, they were expensive. <laughs> now with digital, there's no limit. You can take a number. I would still try to understand how the camera works. You overexpose or underexpose mm -hmm. and take multiple shots, um, okay, which well, is we... what I still do to, to today. Uh, but, but Charleston is, is still my favorite of uh, places on the, um, on the Atlantic side. Uh, it just has the history that mm -hmm. no other place has. Right. I would say it is very comparable to, to Boston right. in, in the history. Right, very good. Well, so we're talking about, uh, you know, United States history. Let's bring it on back to local history and um, talk about the Lebanon area. Um, what photos would you say are your favorites or, or some of your, you know, go-to photos that would be good representation of the Lebanon area? Well, Lebanon has many, many fo photo ops. Um, I was visiting this area, Warren County, I didn't know too much about Lebanon, and I was living in Columbus and I came to the uh, grand opening of Kings Island, mm -hmm. April 1972. Okay. And the opening of Kings Island in 1972, if we look at some of those photos, looks completely different than it does today. The, uh, the Eiffel Tower is still there. Some of the, some of the uh, roller coasters are still there, but it is not the same. You see the, uh, I'll, I'll show you some shots that were taken from, from the tower and you see areas where there's no buildings. Um, the, uh, there's, the, there's the railroad. See, see, the news cameras were there because this was opening day. Uh -huh. <laughs> There was a slide. Um, here are some of the shots from, from, from the tower. But now these buildings that were maybe uh, warehouses or something are a part of the rides today. Uh, it, it is completely different. You, you really get a sense from looking at these photos of Kings Island that at the time it was located where it is now, people thought, they're building that in the middle yeah. of the countryside, right? Right. Well, I, I heard, heard a story. Um, the, uh, the Taft organization owned Coney Island. Uh, don't write to me if I'm wrong about this, but, uh, and of course, Coney Island flooded every year. It's mm -hmm. right on the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. And so they, the idea was to build a year round or at least a, three-season uh, park. And the story that I heard was that um, the Taft people talked to uh, Walt Disney. Disney had built his park in, in uh, California in the 50s, and the, the quote I remember hearing, Disney said, buy as much land as you can. Uh -huh. And if you need 200 acres, buy 400. Really? Okay. Yes. okay. And apparently that's what they did. I have no inside knowledge of that, uh, but they're certainly expanding and they continue to, to expand. Just, just it, it is a great place to, uh, to shoot. Uh, one of the last things that I shot here is uh, on, on a Sunday, I just decided to walk around town. Mm -hmm. And I have a big uh, thing for signs. And these beautiful signs, well-made, very colorful, were just, just uh, waiting to be photographed. Right, right, right. <laughs> now people say that's kind of unusual, but uh, for me, it's a, it's a way of capturing something. Um, I'll actually throw a plug. Uh, I don't have it on this screen, but uh, uh, about, a, about a month ago, I went to the Sign Museum in Cincinnati, and uh, that, that, that's an interesting place mm -hmm. as well. But for this area, there's so many photo ops um, this was a, this is in, uh, 1983 and I just decided to go out. This is film 
and shoot some black and white of rivers in the, uh, the banks with snow. Uh, I like it, maybe some people don't, but I, I like it. I, I like the contrast, and th this goes back to Ansel Adams. Right. So, sometimes color can uh, clutter a photo. With black and white, you're, the eye is limited. Mm -hmm. It looks at the structure of the photo. Now, was this local? Were these local? Yeah, that's the uh, places. What is that bridge, Dave? The there by Heisey Park. Oh yes, yes, I have. For a governor, Nixon Bridge, Corwin M. Nixon. Co oh, Corwin Nixon yes. Bridge. That Thank that is you, it. Dave. Yes, <laughs> Dave is good. Dave is on our camera Dave, today. Dave is on you. the camera and, <laughs> and answering questions. Answering questions. So that's the, that's the other. Well, we can chat about Europe. When did you first travel to Europe? Well, I first traveled to uh, Europe in 1977 to Zurich and Lucerne. This was a business trip. Uh, this is when I worked at uh, the Omar Corporation in Cincinnati, and they, I think, owned a company in Zurich, and we were going to, uh, I had designed some new equipment, and we were going to showcase that for them and their reps. Um, but I was with the Omar sales manager and he wasn't going to stay in Zurich. So we went to Lucerne and we went to the Jungfrau Mountain. These are some mountain photographs okay. of the beautiful views from the mountain. And the interesting thing about the mountain is there is a train that goes through the mountain. This train actually was tunneled not over the mountain, but it threw to to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, there I think is the top of the mountain, and you can get off, and there are uh, large uh, holes in the mountain where you can get out. I think it's the uh, highest observatory in Europe is also ah, there. Ah. Uh, so this was a very interesting place. You can see the snow on top. Uh, you were you were way up there. Way up there. Uh, beautiful mountain views. This is that railroad, and this is uh, down in the valley. And this is looking straight down at a village uh, uh, below, uh -huh. uh, where it was not snowing. So th this was my, my first place, but uh, I, I continued traveling in, in Europe. If you were to return to Europe, where would you go? Well. If I was returned to Europe, I would go to Italy. Mm -hmm. Italy um, has not only the history, it has the culture, it has the food, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and it has the wine. I'll, I'll show you that. Okay. Um, well, I did go with a group. Uh, to Italy, and I would have to recommend the Amalfi Coast as one that you should definitely put on your itinerary for photo opportunities. Well, I've, I've got some, uh, I'll, I'll show you some photos okay. of uh, Sicily if we have time. Well, but, and of uh, course, Rome, the Vatican but, but, is beautiful. Uh, the, the Vatican, uh, this is the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. Michelangelo painted this in the 15th century. Um, I'm not sure where this is, but that, that's a cool staircase. Yes. This is the Colosseum. Florence. Oh, uh, yes. One of my last uh, travels was in Florence. Uh, just, it, it, it looks crowded, and it is crowded because of all of the buildings, all of the museums. Um, here, here's another shot from, from the hill. Yes. Uh, I highly recommend... Um, Rome, uh, Florence, uh, this is a, a street. I wasn't sure that was gonna, gonna come out. Again, this was with film. Mm. Uh, but I did some processing of this. I like the alley and the uh, contrast. Right. Um, so you were actually able to uh, maneuver that yourself. Yeah, so you can... after I scanned it, after I scanned the film, okay. I was able to adjust it a little bit because th this was almost black. Oh. And I had to have some 
lead in. The eye goes from left to right. How do we right. find something here to anchor it to go that way? Okay. Um, and also wine. <laughs> but of course. Well, my agent in, in Italy was always trying to invite me to his farm. And finally I agreed and my wife and I went to uh, Florence and he uh, took me out to his farm. It isn't really a farm, it's a, it's a grape vineyard, a uh, wine making operation, and a bed and breakfast. Oh my. People from all over the world go there for <laughs> weddings. <laughs> <laughs> what a delightful surprise. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting place. Uh, this was, was uh, Malazzo in Sicily. And this was, while working, we had, there was a refinery there and um, we went there to, uh, to work, but uh, I think it was a Sunday and we took the day off and we explored uh, the, uh, the ruins. Okay, very good. Well, um, oh, let me ask you this before we go to our next topic. Um, in, in taking photos, do you recall ever having started to take a photo and then someone come up, comes up to you and says, oh, you, you aren't permitted to take photos? Has that ever happened? Well, it, it does happen occasionally. It used to be in museums that they would say, this belongs to us and you can't take a picture. Mm. Uh, I've never encountered that in the United States. I encountered it very early in Europe. But now that everybody walks around with, with a camera in their pocket, right? Uh, I, I don't think that's a problem. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, I was curious. I, I don't think that's a problem. Today. So of all the interesting places you visited, what is, let's say, one of your favorites? Well, I'll tell you what. I've, I've been, and you can see on there, I, I didn't mention too much about Asia, uh, but for me, it is right here. It is the Cincinnati Zoo. Okay. The Cincinnati Zoo is top notch. The, uh, I've been to a zoo in, uh, in Asia, uh, Europe, uh, various places in the United States, but nothing can top the Cincinnati Zoo. The Cincinnati Zoo is, not only has the best assortment of animals, but it is well managed and it is constantly growing. This is just a, a, a short, <coughs> this is just a short, um, view of some of my favorites. I like the polar bear waving at me. <laughs> Definitely. Hopefully that was strong glass. And the gardens, the botanical gardens. Yes, the botanical gardens. Look there. Yeah, it's uh, for, for the spring, it is, it is the best. And it's, uh, it's right in our home, home backyard and uh, it's ever changing. It's great all year round. So for something to, to see world-class zoo, it, we have it. It's right here in our own it, region. It is right here. It Very is right good. here. Well, um, you know, we've talked about recreational travel and, you know, you kind of mixed it in with your business travel. But, um, you know, for folks that are considering promotional kinds of things for their organization, what um, words of wisdom or counsel would you give them in, in terms of the value of having their photos organized in a manner uh, as you've shown us on Flickr and so forth? Well, uh, we, we've talked about Flickr, we've talked about the advantages of the organization mm -hmm. and why I chose host Flickr. In, um, in about two, 2015, uh, Miami University's Institute of Learning and Retirement, we call it ILR, contacted me and um, asked me to put their photos online. Uh, they, their, uh, their organization started in uh, 1997 and they had uh, about uh, 
eight years worth of photos that they had taken, some of their um, people had taken, and they wanted to showcase them. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a great idea. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the photos weren't, weren't listed. They weren't, um, it didn't say what they were. And, uh, and therefore I had to go through their catalogs. This is the home page for the Institute of Learning and Retirement. Mm -hmm. Sorry to slide it back and out forth, but th this, is the, this is the organization. And they have a link on here to their Flickr photos. Some are mine, but most of them are there. So these are the, the very early uh, photos. And we found some from 97 and we made, uh, these are individual collections with albums. Each album is a different uh, subject. Um, I think some of my photos are on there. I, this is just somewhat <laughs> random. Uh, these are classes. This was a statuary in Hamilton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition, ILR published class bulletins for every semester, which was April and October. And I put a link to those bulletins. They're actually on Google. But since we can write text on here, I can make it a full subject. So if somebody wants to see what we did in Hamilton, they could look at more text over here. Well, I have to say, as helping Miami University ILR with their promotion and PR, I think photos of um, our travels and our classes speak much more to the senses of people than, you know, just pages and pages of text right. where they'd read about the classes. That's all well and good but when they actually see the images of the class participants, I think that speaks um, so much, you know, so much more directly. And when I was so surprised when I read that you said the photo collection had received 70,000 views. 70,000 views uh, in the last year they were in operation. Okay. Obviously they weren't in operation last year, so this was in in the year, year before. But that's a typical ones that I've seen about 70,000 views. I will say though that we have been in operation online and I actually have been taking pictures of our classes okay. online. <laughs> while, yeah. it's on my, while it's on uh -huh. my video screen, I'm taking okay. pictures with my phone. So I'll probably okay. have some more pictures for you. Okay. So I can see uh, how Miami University ILR has benefited from uh, you sharing your photography talents uh, with us. Uh, tell us more about another very well-known nonprofit that has also benefited. Yes, uh, Shelley, in uh, 2000, uh, the Warren County Historical Society contacted me and said, we'd like to put some of our Western Star newspaper photos when the Western Star went out of business, they gave all of their photos, all their back, back issues to the uh, Warren County Historical Society. And um, so I worked with them. We decided on about 10, 10 years uh, worth starting in 1971 through 1980. And I did the same thing, more or less the same thing with, uh, with them that I did with the Institute of Learning and Retirement. Um, they did the same thing as well. They put a link to these Western Star photos on their website. So we're going to go to their website and this is, this is organized differently. This is not organized by places or, or th things like that. This is organized by time. Okay. And if we open uh, one of the years, uh, this um, 1976, these are January, F February, 
Sometimes there are two. One is the community, meaning non-sports. And these are photos taken by the camera people. These weren't photos from the newspaper. What I found were actually photos that were taken uh, by the photographer and printed. Ah. So I just scanned the, the prints okay. and put them online. Okay. And this has been very successful uh, in, in one year, because I really didn't have it on until uh, about one year ago. They have 120,000 views of these photos. That's amazing. Uh, and I think very little publicity mm -hmm. uh, to get them out. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can add to this in, in the future. But I encourage all nonprofits uh, to contact me ab about using Flickr. Uh, we're going to put my email on the, uh, on, the, on the screen. Feel free to contact me about how to use Flickr to showcase your photos, your events, your outings, and better explain what your nonprofit does. And that's what we did for uh, Miami U University Institute of Learning and Retirement and for the Warren County H History Society. These are exactly the same things. And uh, nonprofits are eligible for a free <coughs> um, pro account with unlimited photos and, and videos. Good to know. And I will be happy to help them w with that, help them how to get started. Uh, and I'm talking to some other nonprofits as well about doing this. Uh, it, it's a little known fact about, about Flickr. But this is, this is the, the, the power of putting photos and videos online. And there's no cost normally. It doesn't cost a lot. You don't have to hire people. Uh, you just have to, to try it and, and use it. And I'll be happy to share my experiences. As Shelley said, I taught Flickr at the Institute of Learning and Retirement, and I have those documents and, and videos to, to help, help people. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to um, walk us through some of your photo experiences and your experience as a photographer. Um, I think especially as more and more of us, as you mentioned, everybody has a camera with them when they have their phone with them. So I think people have, um, you know, copious amounts of photos, but yet unless you can organize them and place them somewhere where you can actually, you know, have access to them, um, they probably aren't nearly as valuable to you um, just as miscellaneous, you know, photos on your phone. So I hope that our audience is taking note of the fact that we have a veteran photographer right here in our midst. And um, I know that Paul will be happy to help you um, and we hope that you're feeling good. Bye for now.